Um, we've got uh, 55 registered and we have uh, about 28 on. So let's just give it another minute or two. Um, that way we can talk uh, and do it all at the same time. Welcome to my home, by the way. Glad that you could come. Um, this is my uh, home office down in the basement. 31. Is this about it, maybe? I'll watch the uh, waiting room and admit them as they come in. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to be sensitive of our time. So welcome, everyone. Um, when Mona told me that this many people signed up for the history of the nativity and art, I really wondered about your all social life. So um, <laughs> what social life? I saw somebody mouth that. So, um, but this is the kind of stuff that I enjoy. So we'll, uh, we'll do this. A couple of uh, ground rules as we do this. I really don't know what I'm doing here with regard to Zoom, but Miss Mona is uh, the expert and she's going to help me. Um, we have everybody muted just because we have so many. We're, we're, we're planning on 55 people, which really pushes our ability to have, um, you know, this kind of uh, interaction. So what we'll do is if you want to chat with me, you can uh, do the chat function down at the bottom and you can send me a question. I'm going to try to keep the chat up so that I can see your questions. I may not get to everybody and your comments and, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, the, uh, when we, I have about 50 slides. We won't spend that long on each of them, but uh, I'm hoping to get done in about 50 minutes. So that's giving about one, one minute per slide, but that's not true because some slides will only spend 20 or 30 seconds on. And then at the end, if we have some time left over and we haven't lost too many people, we, I, I can uh, maybe uh, uh, answer some of your questions, but if you have any big questions, uh, you can throw them at me. So this is the nativity and art. First of all, I told Miss Mona I was gonna start our class with, if there's anyone here that has a PhD in art history, they have to let us know now, because if you do, you're going to start teaching this class, not me. So uh, I don't have a advanced degree in art, uh, and um, but I do enjoy history and I do have uh, some advanced degrees in that. And uh, so if you are an arts person, I know we have some art majors here. My goal here is not to necessarily talk about the median and the artist and the history of the artist. My goal here is to show you literally how the nativity has been displayed throughout history and how that has impacted the church and how we understand uh, this event that we are about to celebrate. So uh, we're gonna go through it real quick and let me share my screen. Let me put this over here so I can see it. So this, uh, <clears throat> give me a second here, I'm sorry, forgive me. So as I've said, this is the story of the nativity and art. So the nativity, everybody knows, sometimes it's called the creche. Uh, it is the display that we oftentimes think about with Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, uh, the shepherds, the magi, and uh, sometimes some angels and sometimes some um, uh, farm animals of various kinds. Uh, we, um, it is important to recognize that we really don't see the nativity as we understand it today until about the 1300s. And so it, it's, been, it's going to be a long time before what we think of as the nativity really becomes something that the church focuses on. As a matter of fact, when the church starts thinking about Jesus and Mary, uh, the first thing that we see <clears throat> are uh, uh, frescoes that we have found in catacombs, specifically in Rome. We, we continue to find catacombs in other parts of the world, 
uh, particularly what is present day Turkey, which was anciently Asia Minor. But some of the best preserved ones that we have are in Rome. And that's primarily because by and large, for the most part, Christianity has controlled the city of Rome, uh, except for a few, few blips. And uh, so a lot of the Christian uh, iconography or paintings, that's a real fancy way of saying the, the icons or the paintings of, of faith uh, have been preserved. They haven't been destroyed by invading armies. The earliest that we have is that we know of baby Jesus and Mary is the, uh, this fresco that's entitled Madonna and Child. It's in the catacombs of St. Priscilla, uh, which is in Rome. It is a tomb that belonged to the uh, Glabrio family, uh, which uh, tradition says they were executed by Domitian. Now, Domitian reigned from, 81, from the year 81 to the year 96 AD. And so we know that that's at least in the first century. But to, uh, uh, to, to be fair, uh, to uh, historians and archaeologists, we generally date this particular fresco <clears throat> to the second century. And um, it is uh, greatly debated about what exactly this fresco is of. It's quite clear, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, it's quite clear that this is Mary and this is Jesus. Uh, the folks who study this think that Jesus is nursing here. Uh, although it looks to me like his face is turned towards the viewer, turned turn toward the viewer. But again, I'm not the expert. I'm just telling you what others say. The interesting thing is who this dude is right here. Historians greatly debate it. Um, the irony, the interesting aspect of, of, of this is, is that no one has ever said that this is Joseph, which uh, we're going to see as we go in, into this. Most people say this is either the prophet Isaiah uh, for which the book of Isaiah would have been very important in the first and second and third century of the church. It was called the gospel of the Old Testament. Most preachers, when they preach sermons uh, in the first couple of hundred years, by and large, used the book of Isaiah. And so Isaiah was greatly uh, uh, relied upon to prefigure Christ. And so some uh, historians say that this is Isaiah. Others say that this is the Annunciation, uh, the angel Gabriel. The only problem with that is, is that there's a baby in Mary's arms, so it's probably not the Annunciation. But it is the oldest uh, depiction that we have, and it's often uh, uh, de um, uh, described by historians as a Marian depiction, M-A-R-I-A-N. That is a depiction of Mary. And so the oldest paintings or frescoes that we have of the Holy Family or parts of the Holy Family generally center around Mary and speak to the importance of Mary in the first couple of hundred years of the church. If you want to learn more about the development of Mary and, and how she did, we'll have to do that in a church history class. The second oldest uh, that we have in Rome is uh, in the same uh, grouping of catacombs, but a different uh, tomb. Catacombs are nothing more than tombs. Uh, they're all underground. You can go look at them if you go to Rome today. And this is in the catacombs of St. Calixtus, and it's the visit of the Magi, and it's dated to fourth century. Now, I want you to look down here at this screen on the Magi, uh, <clears throat> a couple of things that we see uh, um, is that the Magi are dressed like Persians. So this leads into the idea that the, they, they wear Persian hats. These little hats that they have on are Persian. And by Persia, we're talking about modern day Iran. And they're wearing uh, the, the clothing and the sandals that would have been common in Persia, which says that in fourth century, that the church was probably convinced that the Magi were from Persia uh, or present day Iran. Some historians debate this and argue this because they say that uh, the, the Magi were Nabataeans. And the, the kingdom of the Nabataeans is just east of, of the area that uh, the southern part of the Dead Sea, the ancient land of the Edomites um, and, um, and the Moabites. Um, if you ever get to go to the Holy Land and go to Petra, that's the principal trading city of the Nabataean Empire. And so a lot of scholars will say, well, everybody thought that the wise men or the Magi were Nabataeans. This is a pretty good proof that at least in the fourth century, the church didn't believe that. The church believed that they were Persian, so that they were from what is present day Iran. Notice also that they're not dressed as kings, they're actually dressed as 
teachers or as magi or magicians, wise, holy men who, who studied various religions and that sort of thing. So those are the oldest depictions that we have, at least in Rome. Now, what we're going to see as we go uh, into these next couple of depictions is, is we're going to see that the uh, Magi uh, are the predominant uh, focus of the earliest paintings or depictions or sculptures or carvings that we have of baby Jesus. And they follow a very ancient model of tribute. This is a, uh, a, a fresco-esque uh, depiction from 2000 BC in the Middle Dynasty of Egypt, where you have Nubian slaves. Nubians was the kingdom just uh, south of Egypt. Um, many historians believe that the Nubian Empire was replaced by the Egyptian, Egyptian Empire. And you can see this depiction even prior to Christ that there is this idea of people bringing gifts uh, to monarchs. And this style of painting, this style of, depi of depictions was very important in Christianity. Uh, normally when you look at a, 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 a card, Christmas card with the Magi, you kind of have them surrounding the, the, uh, the manger or, or if you're setting up your own nativity in your home, you'll, you'll place them in, in various areas. It's first of all important to remember that the Magi don't come to the manger. Matter of fact, they don't arrive for some years later after Christ is born, according to the biblical text. But, uh, but, the, st but the style of how the visit of the Magi is displayed becomes very important and carries on this tradition of how uh, a conquered people or a ruled people would bring tribute to their king. And that's really important in understanding how the early church perceived the birth of Jesus, that his kingliness, his, his kingship was important, and they carried that uh, focus over when they sought to depict uh, the Magi bringing gifts. And here is an example of that, a uh, carving from a fourth century sarcophagus in Rome. Uh, that's a really nice way of saying a real fancy casket. Uh, you have the Magi, these, these, these people bringing tribute uh, uh, to the Christ child here. And notice that the Christ child is also a child. He's not an infant. He's not a baby, which conveys also that at least in the fourth century, the church did not view the visitation of the Magi as something that happened on Christmas or on the day, on the day of the nativity or the birth of Jesus Christ, but that it was an event that occurred uh, sometime later. And as historians look at these depictions, which are by far the oldest depictions that we have uh, around the, the, the events of what we consider to be the Christmas story, uh, they are of the Magi visiting the child uh, who's able to sit up and in many cases is able to receive gifts. This next one is another great example. This is actually a cast off a third century sarcophagus. So it's actually older than the one that I previously showed you. It's, it's uh, a sarcophagus of a woman named Severa. We know that because her name is written on the lid. And uh, the, 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 uh, um, the Latin there is Severa and Deo Vivas, which means Severa, may you live in God. And so the phrase that's on this sarcophagus lid is actually a part of an ancient baptismal liturgy uh, that was influenced by the book of Colossians, and the references are there if you want to go back and look at it, uh, where the, um, the idea of who Jesus is is now beginning to develop. The fact that the phrase says, Severa, may you live in God, which is written alongside of the Magi bringing the gifts to the Christ child, shows that in the third century, the church had already for the most part, begun to settle this idea that Jesus is God. Now, this isn't universal, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you're going to hear a lot of people on History Channel or the National Ge Geographic Channel that will argue that this idea of Jesus being God didn't occur until after the church became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th and 6th century. That's simply not true, and this is, an ex this is a perfect archaeological example of in the third century, the church was fairly convinced 
and was and was consoled uh, in the fact that Jesus was indeed God. But again, that same model of displaying the Magi that you find in the uh, uh, the fresco of the Nubians bringing tributes to the king, that same style is seen here as well. This continues to grow, and we 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 still are seeing when we look at ancient pictures of the events around which we think of around Christmas, we still haven't seen your traditional nativity scene yet. Uh, this is a, a mosaic. A mosaic is little teeny stones of different colors that are arranged in such a way as to, is to show a picture. Uh, they're wonderful because they stand the test of time because they're made of stone. Uh, they typically are not damaged by sunlight. Uh, so they, uh, they're able to exist for long periods of time. And notice here, this is the sixth century. Uh, the lower picture here shows you the context of this, this, this mosaic that's on the wall of St. Apollinari Church in Ravenna, Italy. Um, and this bigger picture is, is, is a zoom in of this area right here, which is the three magi that are bringing uh, the gifts to the Christ child. Uh, in the bigger picture, it's not noticed, but if you look down here, you can see here's the Christ child. This is Mary and the Christ child. Uh, and we have angels on either side of Mary and the Christ child, but who do we not have? We don't have Joseph. Um, the, uh, again, you have that same image uh, of these Persians they're wearing the hats that were common in Persia. They're dressed much like Persian magi or magicians or teachers would have been dressed. But, and, and this is the sixth century. Uh, this church was built somewhere around the year of 500 AD as an Aryan church. Um, an Aryan church, uh, and I don't wanna to get too much into this, Arianism was ultimately declared a heresy, but it's still in, in the fourth century but it still existed really well up into the 500s and the 600s. Arianism is uh, the teachings of a man named Arius who lived from the year 256 to 336. He was a presbyter, an elder, a, a pastor, a, a priest uh, in the church in North Africa, actually. And he began to teach that Jesus Christ is indeed the son of God, but he's begotten by God the Father. He's not co-eternal with God. So he begins to say, Jesus is not uh, God, uh, but he is divine, but he doesn't maintain the same authority as God the Father. And uh, whether or not this mosaic was done uh, at the time the church was built, or whether it was done after it was reconstituted uh, under the Bishop of Rome in 560 AD, we're not sure. I would suggest that it probably is. By the way, the Bishop of the Rome the Bishop of Rome is the historical way of referencing the Pope, uh, or what we would consider to be Orthodox or Catholic Christianity or Western Christianity, of which we as Protestants are the inheritors of. What's really interesting about this mosaic it, in the sixth century, it is the first time that we see two things. Number one, it is the first time that we see the Magi named, Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of differing ideas of who they represent. Uh, anciently, it was thought that they represented the three primary races of humanity. Uh, in the ancient times, there were only three races: uh, what we would view to be African, what we would view to be Asian uh, or Eastern, and what we would view to be European. So, black, white, and yellow. If you want to get a little bit more crass about it. The interesting thing here is that in this particular mosaic, the Magi are not displayed, not portrayed based on race, which was uh, the predominant way the Magi had been portrayed. Uh, but here they are portrayed in the seasons of a human being's life. So what you have is you have youth, you have adulthood, and you have old age, the clean shaven boy, uh, the man with the black beard, and then the man with the gray beard. And so this becomes, so now we're beginning to see the transition of the Magi being not a representation of the Gentile peoples 
or the, the, the three predominant races of the planet Earth, but we're seeing this as the phases in which we as human beings live. And so that this is the fullness of my life that is being presented uh, to the Christ child as my sovereign and as my king. Um, we, uh, up until this point, we have seen mainly the three magi. Uh, the reason that there's three magi is because there are three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But nowhere in the scriptures does it say that there were three magi. It only says there were three gifts. And so we do see some correlations uh, with uh, the magi and the gifts. But here's an example uh, from Cappadocia, which is Turkey, Central Asia Minor, East Central Asia Minor. In the seventh century, we don't know who did this, but here we have six magi uh, and three gifts. So apparently this guy here was upset because he forgot to bring a gift. I don't know. Um, but the, another wonderful thing that we begin seeing here in the seventh century, we still have the Madonna or Mary. We still have the Christ child, not the infant. But lo and behold, look who has showed up. We now finally have Joseph on the scene. We continue to go and look at other, this is, a, this is also a mosaic uh, in Rome. And this is actually a piece of a larger mosaic of, uh, of the uh, presentation of the gifts by the Magi. Here I've just zoomed in. You can just see the arm of one of the Magi here presenting the gift to the Christ child. Uh, the interesting thing here, though, is, is that Joseph doesn't have a predominant place. He's back here in the back. He doesn't have a halo. And this guy right here is an angel. Now, the interesting thing about this is typically angels were displayed with mosaics of white or gold. This uh, angel has a mosaic of blue. And so a lot of historians uh, believe that um, this mosaic is intended to convey uh, some level of, of, of maybe an earthly person that had begun to take on prominence and importance in the church. Some historians actually think that it was probably a mosaic of uh, Pope John VII, who was the guy that commissioned the mosaic. And so whoever the artist was decided to put the likeness of John VII in the form of an angel who would have been viewed, viewed as a prince of the earth and therefore carried the royal color of blue or purple. So it gets kind of exciting as you look through these these old mosaics about why the artists would have chosen the colors and the placement <clears throat> of the individuals. And we can begin seeing how the church is grappling uh, with these things. And, 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 and this particular mosaic, how suddenly it's not so much perhaps that we're trying to present the, the, uh, the, the event in a pure fashion, but whoever was commissioned wanted to make sure that the person who commissioned it John, or John the seventh uh, would have liked it and would have paid. So, you know, it all comes down to money, even in the seventh century and eighth century. Um, we're really beginning to, to go uh, back a little bit. Uh, we've lo looked at the Magi. We, I've shown you over the past seven or 800 years uh, from the time of the uh, uh, catacombs in, in Rome up through the mosaics that uh, dot the ancient world that the Magi were the predominant focus of much of the paintings and mosaics and frescoes that were done about the events of which we think about when we think about Christmas. But what about the actual birth of Jesus, the actual nativity? Well, to do that, we have to go to Italy. Anybody up to go to Italy? We'll go to Milan to the Basilica of St. Ambrose. There's a wonderful story about St. Ambrose. Um, I, I, I won't share it with you tonight, but um, uh, just in short, he did not want to be a pastor, uh, but the bishop came to him and said, God told me you're going to be a pastor. And so St. Ambrose said, well, who am I to argue with God? And so he was ordained and actually became a very faithful and very attentive pastor in the city, in the ancient city of Milan, and was honored with the building of this basilica, this, this great cathedral, this church. Inside of this church is another sarcophagus. And this is the oldest uh, depiction we have of baby Jesus. Remember, the first one that we saw in Rome was a depiction of the Christ child with Mary. 
but here's the oldest depiction of the baby Jesus, dating to about the year 354. Now notice baby Jesus. We don't have Mary. We don't have Joseph. We don't have the Magi. We don't have the shepherds. But what we do have is we have this ox and this donkey. And no, it is not the ancient version of the elephant and the donkey, but it was very, very important in the ancient world about what the ox and the donkey represented, or as you might read in ancient writings, the ox and the ass. And it really comes from uh, two passages of scripture uh, that were very important to uh, the ancient Christians. And that was Isaiah chapter one, verse three, the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know my people doth not consider. And so a lot of people think that, that perhaps this was the carver's way of saying that the church has replaced the synagogue. Now this is 354 AD up until the year 220, the church and the synagogue really worked together in partnership. Uh, after 220, the church begins to separate and is predominantly populated by people who are ethnically Christian. And the synagogue, of course, retains the predominant ethnicity of, of, of the Hebrew people. And so some scholars think that this is a way that this carver is trying to show that as God sent the Christ child, unfortunately, the Hebrew people didn't recognize it. What does this say? That the church are the true people of God. So some scholars think that this uh, carving could have been a, uh, I, I hate to use these modern day terms, but could have been some sort of anti-Semitic uh, statement about how the Jews were no longer God's beloved people, that the church had replaced uh, the Jewish people. Another predominant and, and, and probably uh, a uh, more accurate perspective would have come from 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. I really like this one better because anciently the ox represented the Jewish people and the ass represented the Greek people. If you write that text down and you go look at it, Paul is talking about uh, that the, uh, uh, the Jews and the Greeks both stumble over the, the message of the gospel and uh, the ox becomes representative of the Jewish people who bear the weight of the law and look for signs and that the donkey or the ass become symbolic of the Greek people who desire wisdom, and in so doing are foolish. And so that this, this could be a depiction of uh, how um, the, the fullness of bringing together all people, that all people will call God blessed through the coming of the Messiah. And this is a depiction that through Christ, the Hebrew and the Gentile, the Jew and the Gentile uh, come together as, uh, as, as one people under God who worship God alone. The third and final uh, perspective of this is, is that just basically that the animal kingdom knows who the son of God is and they keep him warm with their breath. I don't think that, but uh, I'm not an expert. The other thing that I wanna share with you is, is you'll notice here that there are right uh, leaning uh, swastikas that are here. See these right down here below? We see these uh, periodically in the West. They're predominantly in the East. There are left-facing uh, swastikas and there are right-facing swastikas. Uh, the swastika of Nazi Germany was sort of at an angle, uh, so it doesn't, it really is neither. Um, in in, in um, uh, uh, Hindu and Eastern religions, the swastika uh, takes on signs of life and signs of death. The right swastika is a sign of life the, uh, or a sign of light. The left uh, facing swastika is a sign of darkness or a sign of death. Probably none of these things really had anything to do because this is Milan, Italy. However, Milan was a uh, port town or a town of trade. And so uh, it could have been that those traditions came. But we do see right facing swastikas a lot on ancient Christian symbols. And there's still a lot of debate about what they mean. And, uh, uh, you know, if you have an opinion, it could very well be right because no one's really sure. But I always like to point that out because people will often say, why, is, why are swastikas on these images of Jesus? Well, they didn't know about the Nazis back then. So 
that's probably why. We also begin seeing, uh, now remember, predominantly we saw up through the seventh century, the depictions of the Magi. Beginning in the seventh century, we begin to see more depictions of the Nativity of Christ. Uh, this is a fresco from uh, Cappadocia. Um, but what is fascinating about these, this fresco is the images that are in it begin to depict uh, writings that apparently were well known, uh, and those writings were the Proto-Evangelum of James, or oftentimes called the Infancy Gospel of James, uh, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, pseudo means fake or false, so the Gospel of, of the fake Matthew, and there's also the Infancy Gospel or the Proto-Evangelum of Thomas, or the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Proto-Evangelum just means before the good news or before Jesus began his ministry. And <clears throat> these writings were never considered uh, um, um, valid. They weren't accepted as true canon. They were not viewed as scripture. I don't care what the guy on the History Channel says, he's wrong. Uh, but they were important. They were, they were read. People knew about them. Uh, I want to read to you just very quickly um, a, a lot of the traditions that develop around uh, the Holy Family that you may even have in your nativity and not know about it comes from the Proto-Evangel of James, uh, the infancy uh, book of James. And we'll read this real quickly. There is, for example, in the infancy of James, which begins with an account of the birth of Mary to Jehoiakim and Anna in their old age. So that's the first time that we find out uh, from any sacred writings, pseudo-sacred writings, about Mary's, uh, the, the names of Mary's parents, when they had given up all hope of having children. So now the birth of Mary takes on the same miraculous work as the birth of Sarah, the birth of, I'm sorry, the, the birth of Isaac to Sarah, uh, the birth of Samuel to Hannah, and the birth of John to uh, Elizabeth, and then of course the birth of Jesus to Mary. So you see these situations where a woman is having difficulty having a child, God steps in, and the birth of that child becomes a person whom God uses for great and important works. Like the infant Samuel in the Old Testament, Mary was dedicated by her grateful mother to the service of God in the temple where she was placed in the charge of the priest Zechariah. When she was 12 years old, she was betrothed by her guardians to Joseph. The story of the angelic annunciation and virginal conception follows the nativity narratives of Luke and Matthew with various embellishments. Mary's chastity is vindicated, for example, by the, quote, ordeal of jealousy prescribed in Numbers chapter 5. This is how you would decide if your uh, wife had had an affair. There was a process that you might go through, and Mary was vindicated. Uh, because she became pregnant, Joseph was worried that she had had an affair. And so this, uh, this infancy of James goes through that process from Numbers 5 to show that Mary indeed did not have an affair which speaks to the fact that according to the infancy book of James, that Joseph didn't believe the angel who had come to him. In a cave near Bethlehem, Mary gives birth to Jesus. A woman named Salome acts as the midwife. When Herod fails to find the infant after the visit of the wise men from the east, he tries to lay hands on the child John, later the Baptist. But when he too is not to be found, having been hidden with his mother Elizabeth in a mountain, Herod has his father, Zechariah, put to death in the temple court. And so there's more uh, details that we see in the infancy gospel of James and in the infancy gospel of Thomas and in the pseudo gospel of pseudo Matthew that we begin to see in this fresco. So, for example, here's Salome, who is the midwife to Mary, and she is cleansing the, the newborn baby. Uh, here you have Joseph who is depicted as an extremely old man. Uh, if you read the infancy of James, you'll read where uh, Joseph was so old, he could not do the work that a husband was expected to do. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so this is one of the ways that the church in the seventh century argued that Mary's virginity was, was preserved because Joseph wasn't able to act like a husband uh, to Mary to begin with because of his extreme age. 
and uh, Mary is, uh, is and, and so we begin to see the, um, um, the, the, the teachings of the perpetual virginity of Mary begin to emerge in the church uh, from these nativity scenes. The same thing occurs here. We see a lot of those same things, uh, but we begin to, to meld together. Here you've got uh, uh, Joseph over here looking pretty sad and, and upset. This is a picture of David uh, playing uh, and the, the, the Jesse tree right here, uh, what we think of as the Jesse tree. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm not really sure if this is supposed to be a donkey and, a, and an ox. It's not a very good one, but I think that's what it's supposed to be. The visitation of the Magi. And so we begin to see these images creeping in uh, into these nativities and becoming a regular part of what we might think of to be the Christmas story. Although in the seventh century, it wasn't called Christmas. It was called Epiphany. It wasn't celebrated in December. It was celebrated in January. Here's a, uh, it's not very good because I don't have a really uh, a high, high uh, resolution uh, photograph, but you can see David uh, playing as he sits on the, the, the mountains watching his sheep and his goats, uh, a, a symbol that Jesus is a descendant of David. And so this, this reinforces the Davidic uh, kingship of Jesus, that he, the Davidic lineage of Jesus. Uh, and then the Jesse tree to the left from Isaiah chapter 11, verses one through two. See sort of the same things, except now we're in Sudan. So we begin to see the same kinds of mosaics, the same kinds of frescoes, all of a sudden exploding throughout the ancient land of Palestine, uh, Greece, Asia Minor, North Africa, uh, and into Africa itself. Um, this uh, from a 10th century fresco, that this becomes the predominant story that people think of when they think of the birth of Jesus. Uh, from these pseudo gospels, these, these, uh, these writings which are not considered authentic, but really influence the ancient people. And this particular one from the 10th century, you have Mary who seems, uh, she's kind of, she's displayed as a queen, uh, but she seems to be uninterested in Jesus, but you have the ox and the donkey over here. So these themes begin popping up for hundreds of years, over and over and over throughout the ancient world. Again, another mosaic, now in 1150 in Palermo. Uh, the, the style, I, don't, I won't go into this because we're not really talking about style, but the style begins to change from an iconographic style to a Greco-Byzantine style. That is, is that there's more realism. Uh, there's still some exaggeration of the eyes, the face, the nose, but not as much. Uh, the same themes, though, the Salome down here uh, bathing Jesus all, all looks like he's already starting to get male pattern baldness, even at, the, uh, at, at an early age. Uh, Joseph, who's all over off to the side, uh, significantly older than his wife. Uh, the three magi, uh, their headpieces have been replaced. Uh, no longer are they wearing the, the uh, headwear of the Persians, but now they're wearing pillboxes for some reason. And scholars really struggle with this. They don't know why that, that changed. Um, and then it's still, a, you still have the ox and the donkey. Uh, again, now in a modern icon of the nativity, uh, there is a resurgence of iconography in today. And uh, they are reclaiming some of these lost uh, uh, aspects of the ancient paintings and the ancient mosaics and the ancient uh, uh, frescoes but the same sort of thing. Mary turning away from Jesus, the ox, the donkey, Joseph down here looking kind of sullen and sad, the Magi making their way, uh, and, and the, these things pop up over and over and over again. What begins to happen now as we kind of change gears is up until this point, art really is being used as a focal point of worship. Uh, but the church goes through what is called the iconoclastic controversy as whether or not pictures, paintings, frescoes, statues, great engravings were, were lawful in the church of Jesus Christ. They actually fought wars over and killed each other over it. Ultimately, the church decided that icons were okay, that depictions of Jesus specifically were okay because uh, God himself made himself flesh 
and took upon himself the form of a human being. So therefore, it was appropriate for us to depict God in that human form as Jesus Christ. However, after the account, that's my mother. I'll have to decline my mother's phone call. Uh, after the uh, depictions of, uh, of, uh, of the images of Jesus and, and, and the Holy Family was settled by the church, the use of art really begins to change a little bit away from being a focal point of prayer and more for the purpose of proclaiming and preaching the gospel. And so we see these things called triptychs that begin to emerge. And these are sort of like portable works of art that preachers would take with them uh, as they would preach about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here is a triptych with the scenes of Christ's life carved in the 10th century out of crimson ivory found in Constantinople. And so what the preacher would do is he would set the triptych up on a wall or on a table. He'd open it up. He would point to a scene, and he would begin to preach about that scene uh, in the life of Christ. In addition, they would oft, uh, we, we see this also occurring in Europe. Uh, this is the Book of Kells, which is an illuminated gospel from Ireland. Um, and this also was a way that preachers would uh, take with them uh, these illuminated uh, books uh, because most people couldn't read, and so they would lift up and show everybody the pictures like you do when you read to a kindergarten class. Um, it's important to remember that this would not have been an entire copy of the Bible. It may have been a copy of one book or even a part of a book. But these paintings, these icons, these illuminations, as is the case in, in here, was for the purpose of helping the preacher uh, proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. This begins to come into the church itself. And so we see uh, frescoes and, and statues and mosaics finding their way into the church as well. I mentioned this in a message a couple of weeks ago, that the purpose of them were not to be focal points of worship, but were to be depictions that the presbyter, the elder, could, or the priest could point to as he was preaching the gospel and talking about a particular scene in the life of Christ. Uh, this is the 1100s. Uh, that should be AD, not BC. Uh, in Spain, it is a fresco, and um, it's in the Romanesque style. Um, so uh, we're able to see that the church is now at this point in smack dab in the middle of the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, and um, that uh, you can kind of tell, I mean, the plague has been going on and ravaging Europe. And so we begin to see this change in the depictions of, uh, of the uh, characters of the Bible and the stories that the preachers are preaching on. There's a great deal of solemnity, a great deal of seriousness. Death is something that could happen to you tomorrow. You could be perfectly healthy today, and tomorrow you could get sick, and by tomorrow evening be dead. And so the imminency of death and the frequency of death really makes the gospel a very serious thing. They're not, preachers are not known for their wonderful stories. They're not known for their jokes. They're not known for their, their kindness, their frivolity, or their ability to get along with people. They are trying to get the gospel to you as quick as possible because tomorrow you might be dead. And so we begin to see this uh, being, th this solemnity, this seriousness uh, being displayed in some of the styles of the cathedrals that are being built in the time of the high middle ages. But the modern nativity, isn't that why we came tonight? We want to know about the modern nativity. Well, the modern nativity was developed by a guy named St. Francis. Everybody knows St. Francis. Uh, St. Francis had the idea of creating a living recreation of the birth of Jesus as a way to help his village really kind of get into the uh, uh, Christmas spirit. Uh, Greccio, or Grecio was the town, small Italian town. And he initially called together citizens of the town to act out uh, the, the story of the nativity so that uh, the people would understand what was going on. So as they came, as they, as they got to know the characters they were playing, whether it was Mary or Joseph or the shepherds or the wise men, I remember going through that when I was a kid, you know, if you were in second grade, you were a sheep. If third grade, you got to be a shepherd. Fourth grade, a wise man. 
and the fifth graders always got to be Mary and Joseph. The same thing sort of happened as St. Francis is putting together uh, these real live scenes with real people dressed in biblical robes, real animals positioned outside of a cave, and baby Jesus uh, not being a doll baby, but being a life-sized wax figure. And this in the 13, so in the, in the, in the uh, mid-1200s, really up until the 1300s, this becomes all the rage. But they're not paintings. They're actually, they're, 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 they're like acting. It's like, like theater. And, uh, uh, but as the, the church goes uh, into the late 1200s, we begin to see uh, depictions of the nativity in the church itself but predominantly only in Italy. And here's an example of what that might have looked like, some insight into the style of worship of 13th century Christianity or the 1200s. Notice here that the average everyday people are behind this wall uh, called the iconostasis, the wall that separated the people uh, from the, uh, the altar. And these are leading figures in the community, uh, wealthy people who are able to come in and then this uh, depiction of a manger in which the baby Jesus would have been laid in uh, during the season of Christmas, the covering over the altar, this would have been the communion table. And we can see, uh, I like this painting because up here you can see this beautiful cross, but you see the back of it. Uh, so if you were part of the people on the outside, you would have seen the pretty side of the cross. But if you were here, you would have seen the sort of like standing backstage of a play. What begins to happen here after the 1300s is Christianity be take, begins to take root in the West. Uh, the Europe has been living sort of in the Dark Ages, uh, melding together Christianity and paganism, particularly in places like Germany and certainly further north into Scandinavia, and even to some degree in the British Isles and Scotland and Ireland. Um, but Christianity is really beginning to, to, to take root as a European religion at this point. And so we begin to see in some of these paintings a commentary on faith and practice about how we are Christians and how we are to live. Oh, my goodness. And so I'm going to get through, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. So we begin to see some semblances of the ancient uh, icons with Salome here but she's now minimized. Joseph coming out front, but some of the age old things, the ox, the donkey, again, late Byzantine style, a compromise between the East and the West in terms of art and style, same symbols, got a really grumpy Joseph here. Salome, the ox, the donkey, baby Jesus, Mary turned away. But then as we get into the late medieval period, we begin to see scenes of Christ that are probably a little bit more familiar to us. Here we have a depiction of the Christ child according to the visions of St. Bridget. St. Bridget was a nun who lived between the year 1303 to 1373. She said that uh, God revealed to her exactly how Christ was born. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but for example, Mary never had any contractions. There was no pain. There was no blood. These are the things that St. Bridget said. I'm highly skeptical, frankly, but nevertheless, that, that this kind of serene, quiet, peaceful uh, vision that St. Bridget had about the birth of the Christ child begins to take over in art, but still some of the same things we see the ox, the donkey. But here we also begin to see this overwhelming sense of darkness of the world and light coming from the Christ, the Christ child. So Christ becomes the source of light. As we head into the Renaissance, we begin to see artists like Sandra Botticelli, who was uh, under the patronage of the Medici family. And now we really begin to see things that just, just smack of pure consumerism and, and wealth. Because as these famous artists in the 15th century start painting these depictions of the Holy Family, they start adding, <coughs> excuse me, paintings of their patrons. So this is the uh, patriarch of the, uh, of the Medici family, who was the first who was honoring the Christ child. 
And all of these folks here are members of the Medici family. And so you really have this taking of, of, of great liberty as to who is at uh, the, um, uh, the, the, with Jesus. It's not the, it's not the shepherds. It's, it's not the magi. It's not even the angels. It's whoever paid for the painting. And so uh, we begin to really see this coming up more and more and more. Here's a larger picture of it. Um, sometimes I will take people through the designations of each of these individuals. I don't know if that's necessarily helpful today. Just know that these are all members of the Medici family. The, the ruins that are behind here that, uh, uh, that, are, that are in this painting are actually the ruins <clears throat> of an ancient Roman building uh, called the Basilica, though it wasn't considered a place of worship, but there was a statue of Romulus, one of the founders of Rome. Uh, and uh, uh, tr the, the tradition or the myth was that on the night Christ was born, uh, the, the uh, building the, that, was the, that contained the Basilica uh, the, the building that contained the statue of Romulus collapsed. And uh, this became a very uh, significant story in uh, the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance as a way of showing the superiority of Christianity over paganism. Um, these are examples of how great liberty is being taken with the birth of the Christ child. Um, da Vinci, Francesca, Frangelico, uh, these are paintings where if we look at them closely, there is nothing in the Bible that is reflected in these paintings. But these paintings begin to uh, take on other great meanings, whether it be the ruins that are behind, the preeminence of Christianity over pagan religions, uh, the status and wealth of, of the patrons who paid for the paintings, uh, a army returning in victory, um, all of these things, it, it, it's sort of just, it's, it, it's consumerism at its worst in the age of the Renaissance. Um, um, but yet in the midst of all of it, the artists still try to convey uh, the, the identity of Jesus, that Jesus is God incarnate, that he is Emmanuel. Uh, and so we see a lot of these writings that are in the in the paintings that are really in the midst of paying for all of these people, like these guys who actually pay were the patrons of the artist. Uh, the, the artist is still trying to maintain some dignity and some solemnity uh, to the scene. Here's a beautiful scene about how when Christ comes uh, as people, the, the musicians are beginning to uh, to sing. These are angels as the angels begin to sing that even the magpie uh, falls silent. Fra Angelico's where form begins to meet function. Uh, this isn't a painting uh, uh, that you would hang on a wall. This is a tray that uh, they would have used to uh, place fruit on to bring the women after they had given childbirth to help them regain their strength. And so, you know, you'd have a bunch of grapes and apples and, and pomegranates on this tray. And as you ate the fruit, the, the scene uh, would be revealed by the great artist Fra Angelico. Joseph also begins to change in the Renaissance. Now he's not this old guy who's sitting off to the side sad. He's really sort of a involved husband. Um, and this also comes from the visions of St. Bridget where he's trying to build a fire and prepare a meal for his wife. As we head now to the Reformation, uh, we begin to see something happen that we don't pay attention to, but I think is pretty significant. That is, is that the depiction of the nativity is done in the modern style. Now, not the modern style of 2020, but the modern style of 1500. So here you have Mary and Joseph dressed like somebody would have dressed in the 1500s. Uh, the shepherds dressed like people would have dressed in the 1500s. And so it, 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 you, you, it, this is the closest thing that I can come to an example. This is, the, when you look at that, this depiction of the Holy Family, where you have Mary smoking a cigarette and Joseph and the three magi bringing gifts that they knocked off a liquor store to get, as much as that might irritate you to see because of your faithful sensibilities, 
That's how this painting would have been received in the 1500s. That's the kind of emotion the artist would have evoked when uh, he painted this and you would have looked at this in the 1500s. Would have been the same sort of thing the way you feel about this. And suddenly what begins to happen is artists begin to use the, the painting of the nativity in order to make a statement about contemporary culture or the culture of their time. For example, Peter Bruegel, the elder who paints this, uh, uh, paints the black king with a long sleeve, which was a sign of, 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 of his sinfulness and, and his untrustworthiness, you know, because you, you always put things up the sleeve. Uh, and, and, and this hypocrisy of, of the king who you can't trust with the long sleeve bringing a gift to Jesus. This, this would have been scandalous in 1564. Or the numbering at Bethlehem when, when they're coming. This is a uh, 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 a painting of again by Bruegel uh, about the, the state of poverty and the the overreaching of government and the authoritarianism of government. And so what the uh, what what Bruegel is doing here is he's comparing um, the government of his day to the Romans. Or here another Bruegel, the procession of the cross. You can't really see it now. Bruegel was a Protestant, but you can't really see it. Here in the distance, right where my pointer is, is where Jesus is carrying the cross. You have Mary over here weeping about her son who's about to be crucified. And right here, you have some disciples of Jesus who are being held back by the crowd. Now, you can't really see it very well, and I can't make it get bigger. Whoops. Let me go back. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But you see, if, if you see this little thing hanging on this woman's apron right there? Well, that is a rosary. And so what Bruegel is talking about, it, this is a condemnation of the Roman Catholic Church, that the Roman Catholics were the ones uh, that uh, crucified Christ over and over and over again at the Mass, which was a constant criticism of the Roman Church during the Protestant Reformation. And again, the blind leading the blind, a symbolism of, uh, of how the Roman Church itself blind is leading those who refuse to uh, 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 abandon the papacy and cling only unto the reformers <laughs> and, and scripture alone. And then Rembrandt makes his debut, who is, he's known as the great Protestant artist. And, and one of the things that is beautiful about this is this is in the wake of the Council of Trent, which is the Council of the Roman Catholic it's Church wonderful. that sought to condemn the Protestant Reformation. And what's beautiful about this is as although he uses these people who are the dress of the common everyday people, he also borrows the light uh, that we see back during uh, St. Bridget's uh, first revelations. So there's really a blending of style here, a way that Rembrandt says, yes, Jesus is the light of the world. And, and that's something that we can agree on. That's the Christian faith, but that he comes not to kings or to the Medicis or to rich and famous people, but he comes to the commoner the person who is poor. Uh, it's a bit, it, it, it is sought to, to really inculcate a biblical understanding of the Bible and the story of Jesus's nativity in its rawest sense. Well, meanwhile, Roman Catholic all, uh, artists are now trying to paint against the Protestant artists. So here you have Caravaggio's counter-reformation, the nativity, except here, he puts St. Francis and St. Lawrence here to remind the, the viewer that it is uh, these great Roman Catholic saints that the nativity was made possible to begin with. This particular painting was actually stolen by the mafia. It's, not, it's uh, never, been, never been found. El Greco does the same thing. Uh, again, these paintings are intended to uh, uh, exacerbate Protestants, to, to show that Protestants are wrong, that there is a mystery and a, and a majesty uh, around the nativity that is governed by the Roman Catholic Church and the purity of who Jesus is, is defined and protected by the papacy in Rome. Into the 19th century, we begin to see other aspects of Jesus's life make their way into paintings. Uh, this is called Orientalism, the style. However, it's predominantly uh, 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 used in, in England, <laughs> ironically enough. Uh, but we see uh, uh, Edwin Long, who's very famous with this. He's one of my, fav one of my favorite painters of the 19th century. Uh, this is Jesus and Mary and Joseph 
coming into Egypt as they're fleeing uh, the persecution of Herod and the ultimate massacre of the innocents. Probably he's best known, Orientalism's best artist is James Tussaud's 1894 uh, painting of the Three Magi, another one of my favorites. I actually have a small print of this. I've never framed it, but this is one of my favorite. Uh, but but it, it's, it's more of a realistic style uh, in terms of they're not kings. Uh, there's no effort to dis discuss their age or from what country they come. They're just three wealthy um, um, magi who are coming to uh, proclaim uh, their love and, and commitment to the king. Into the late 19th century, there becomes an interest in the church of ethnicity and urban poverty. So we begin to see nativities that are developed uh, uh, in, the, in the style and in the ethnicity of those to whom they are trying to evangelize. So as missionaries were going to Japan and China, they were depicting scenes in scripture using people who were ethnically Chinese or those who were ministering in the urban cities in the early 20th century, late 19th and early 20th centuries, began to show the nativity scene in the context of the suffering that was going on uh, in, the, in the late 19th and early 20th century as the Industrial Revolution was kicking up. And then, of course, most recently, Everett Patterson's Jose y Maria, which is a sign of a uh, uh, immigrant or refugee uh, family, uh, you can see that this is uh, Mary here on a on a coin fed horse. There, there's no uh, no room at the Dave City Motel, and uh, you have Joseph trying to find some place to stay. And and uh, right here, uh, the wise men. Uh, I, uh, the, the, there, there's some frivolity in this. This is called uh, this style of art um, is uh, is really more popular in Europe than it is in the United States. But it is um, a, a style that is urban, a style that is ethnic, but a style that seeks to draw uh, the viewer into questions of modern day life, of how we handle ethnicity, how we handle poverty, both rural and urban, and how we handle issues of immigration and refugees and those sorts of things. I, I share these with you not as an effort to persuade you on one side or the other, but to show you how the uh, depictions of the nativity have been used uh, throughout the centuries as focus of worship, as an effort to preach the gospel, as a way to speak uh, truth to power, as a way to get us to think about contemporary issues that plague our society today. But what are the modern day icons of Christmas? Well, here you go. The modern day icons of St. Nicholas we had more time, we'd talk about that, but that's not why we came together today to talk about St. Nicholas. But I always like to even show the development of St. Nicholas from the time of the uh, uh, Renaissance uh, with St. Nicholas, who was an icon of generosity, an actual priest uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Myra, the city of Myra, and how the image of St. Nicholas changes from a, a holy man to a bishop who sought to care for the children to the fat man with the pipe and to the final version of the fat man with the Coca-Cola. However you see art and however art seeks to speak to you, we have uh, a new trend that is developing. And, and this is my last slide, a new trend that seems to be developing, which I don't necessarily have a problem with, but it is unique and it is the blending of the secular with the sacred. We have Santa Claus bowing to pray at the manger where Jesus is. Now, whether this is beautiful, whether this helps you love the holidays or not, in a hundred years from now, a pastor is going to have a uh, night presentation of the history of art and the nativity, and he's going to talk about how the sacred and the secular came together way back in 2020 and what effect that had on the church as a whole. That's the conclusion of our presentation. Don't forget that we have our Christmas Eve service in person in the parking lot at four o'clock and at six o'clock online. I'm looking at the chat box. Is there anybody that has any questions, Miss Mona?
Miss Mona's looking like, holy mackerel, you got to all that in one hour? Uh, you know, you know me, church, I could speak three hours about this stuff, but I want to be sensitive to your time. Does anybody have any questions, comments, uh, anything that you want to share? Mona, is the best way to, for them to do that to type it, or is that the best way? Sorry about that. Um, yes, they're they're chatting with you. And I don't see anything coming up. Don't you? I don't. Are they chatting? Yeah. Could you stop your sh sharing your screen? Oh. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. No, I have no chatting coming up. Okay. Raise your hand if you have a question and I, I'll unmute you. <laughs> Bill Yegley. Okay. Just so you know, uh, starting on the 20 morning, the afternoon of the, I'm sorry, the Christmas star is supposed to be reappearing as a result of the, the combination of Mercury and Jupiter on the 21st, looking to the southwest at sunset. You should be able to see that two planets coming together and shining. And there's some speculation that that is, in fact, it only happens every 800 years. And it's going to happen on the, the evening of the 21st. Did you like it the first time it came, the first time it happened? It, was it good? I wasn't there. <laughs> oh, sorry. Some of the crew here thought that was funny. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? I gotta go. I'm late for my class. Yes, uh, Brad, is it Brad Kershaw? But that's not Brad. Brad's sitting next to me. He's over oh. there. Oh, <laughs> hi, Brad. All the way from Texas. All Are you in Texas? Texas? God bless you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for doing this. It was a very interesting evening. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, and then I wondered if you had ever seen, uh, it's a, actually a, a sculpture piece. Uh, it's called Let Mother Sleep. And it shows Joseph holding yes. the baby and Mary is sleeping on the slab on the bed. That's a relatively recent sculpture. I don't, I don't know if uh, I can find this real quick. Uh, let me see here. Um, is it Let Mother Sleep? Is that what it's called? I think so. Yes, let mother, let sleep. mother sleep. Uh, ah, there it is. Let's pull this up here. Hold on. Um, yeah, this has gotten a lot of criticism uh, from uh, from various folks. There, let me let me share the screen. Share there. Share there. Do you see that right there? Uh -huh. Let mother sleep. So here we have uh, Mary sleeping and Joseph is taking care of baby Jesus. And uh, you can purchase this. Um, and um, yes, th this is, uh, I, I, you know, I look at it from, a, from, from more of a, a his critical eye. It really reminds me of the useful Joseph that uh, uh, the uh, images of St. Bridget had uh, that we see Joseph not being uninterested and off to the side, but actually involved. And so it kind of is reminiscent of that. But it's, it, it's a wonderful depiction that, that uh, displays Joseph perhaps as a more active father than the church has generally thought of him. So that's thank you for bringing that up. Uh, where did she go? There she is. I'm sorry. Thank, that's, thank you for that. I hope that uh, you all can look that up and, and learn more about it. Any other comments, questions? Uh, Jill? Jill? No. Let me look here. The, the Gretemans. Gretemans. So when did um, the, the nurse practitioner, whatever her name is, Solomon? Lomi. Mm -hmm. Lomi, go away. Because that's uh, our Bible or... She, she, she hasn't fully gone away even now. Uh, you know, as Protestantism ramped up in the 20th century, 19th and 20th century, she sort of has fallen away from popular depictions. 
But even in modern day icons, she's still there. Remember I showed you that icon, a modern day icon, and she's still there. Uh, you know, the story of her, she's actually unnamed in the, uh, in the infancy narrative of James. Um, and, uh, but, you know, uh, if you read um, predominantly in Roman Catholic spirituality, they'll still talk about her. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I, I often say to people that, uh, you know, people say, when did the, when did the church finally decide that the apocryphal book shouldn't be in the Bible? And I always say, when publishers realized it wouldn't make them any money. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the same thing happens with Salome as, as artists and publishers and people who, who try to make money on this stuff, uh, realize that not very many people knew who Salome was or even had this concept of the midwife, uh, which would have been common. There's a whole history behind that. We could have spent some time talking about that. Uh, that would have been a very common Jewish practice. Even going back into Egypt, midwives are very important in the Bible. And so it's not unusual that Salome or a midwife comes into the Bible. But just because of uh, biblical uh, awareness, uh, it became confusing. And so uh, con uh, people who sell paintings and sell Christmas cards and, and, and all that stuff said it's just more trouble than it's worth. And so she dropped away because she didn't help anybody make any money. That, that's a little jaded, uh, maybe, but I think that it's probably pretty accurate. But that's a good question. Any other questions? Nope. And we're we're dropping off. Oh, Lori, go ahead. So why do they start showing Mary turning her back on Jesus? That's a great question. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> so um you, you know, um I don't think we really know why we, we some, some some historians think it's a matter of style uh, in that the, the painting should be, um, you know, facing the viewer. And so Mary being turned away from Jesus, uh, she's simply facing the viewer. The other question that I think is probably uh, um, also helpful to think about is, is why is Jesus in the back? Um, probably, uh, we're dealing in a period of time where the doctrine of who Mary is, is being worked out by the church. The church argues about Mary starting about the 13, 1400s and goes all the way up until 1848, I think, uh, when, uh, Mary is declared immaculately conceived, the immaculate conception the perpetual virginity, the sinlessness of Mary. And, and I think that uh, there's a lot of debate that was going on in the church for those uh, 500 years about whether Mary functions as a co-redemptrix. That is, is that she is also uh, functions as a redeemer of sorts. Um, now, we Protestants never got into those arguments, but... Uh, but in Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, expressions of the faith, those became really important conversations. And, and more than likely, we see these icons presenting Mary in a more prominent role uh, is as these folks are trying to deal with those doctrinal issues. But I'm not sure anybody really knows. And if a art historian says that he or she does know, they're probably just being cocky. Thank you. Excellent question, though. Any others? Well, next year, maybe we'll do, oh, Cheryl Sartain. Now, Cheryl is a art major, so I'm not sure I want her to speak, Mona. Can we just <laughs> mute her? The last that thing was, I want is an art that major. That was 45 years ago. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> I'm curious to know how the Muslim faith has portrayed Jesus. So the Muslim faith would not portray Jesus in art, number one. 
because they they are they don't believe in they portraying art. Yeah, they're they're uh, uh, they're iconoclasts, right. meaning that they do not want to see depictions of human beings, any human being, mm -hmm. and especially God in art. And so much of their art is a calligraphic art of writings from the Quran. Um, now, in terms of how they understand Jesus, uh, I, there's a wonderful study we could do on the uh, development of Islam. Um, uh, uh, Muhammad was raised by his uncle, who was a Nestorian monk. Nestorianism was a kind of Christianity that was ultimately declared a heresy. And it was a Christianity that said that Jesus was human, uh, not divine. And um, uh, so it makes sense that Islam and Muhammad's view of Jesus was greatly influenced by Nestorianism. However, the, the, the Muslims do believe in the virgin birth. They believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. They believe that he was a prophet. They believe that he was righteous. Uh, they wouldn't say sinless necessarily, but they wouldn't say that he sinned either. They would have just said that he was righteous. Um, and they believe that uh, he was arrested, uh, and, but before he was uh, died on the cross, he was replaced by somebody, and God, uh, Allah, took him straight to heaven, and uh, that Muhammad, when Muhammad was at the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is where the ancient temple would have been, Muhammad was taken into heaven, and Jesus waited on him when he went to heaven, which really ticked off the Christians in the sixth and seven hundreds. But, um, um, but their view of Jesus is quite high. They, they, they honor uh, Mary. Uh, they believe that it was a virgin birth. They believe that she was a righteous woman and he was a righteous man. And uh, they, they just, they just, they don't believe he was the Messiah uh, in the way that we understand Messiah today. They believe he was a, a prophet a righteous prophet, and the prophet who it really in Islam, Jesus functions like John the Baptist functions for us. As John the Baptist proclaims the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, Jesus the prophet proclaims the coming of the last Messiah, or the last prophet, who is Muhammad. Good question, though. Any others? Maybe we'll do this again next year in the sanctuary on the big screen so that you can actually see them. And, um, and that'll be fun just to be together. So anything else? Oh, did I see another hand raised or just a, the Gretemans have their hand raised again, Mona. Brad? Did you say Brad? No, uh, Gretemann. Oh, Kim? Kim. There, now you're open. Not that you have anything going on, but we could do the crucifixion and art. <laughs> so I, I, I actually have a, a, I have a presentation of the crucifixion and art and would be glad to do that around Good Friday. Maybe, I don't know, that's actually not that far away. Uh, Lent begins middle of February, I think, this year. So I don't know if we'll be back together by then, but um, yeah. Thank you for sharing your expertise. I'm not an expert. Thank you. I'm not an expert on this. But thanks for sharing what you know. Ah, that's better. But Kim, the last thing I want is a PhD in art history to come in and make me look like an idiot. So, humility is the key. It is. So, all right. This will be recorded and it will be somewhere. And if you want to know how to get it, can I just have them call you, Mona, or send you an email? <laughs> call the office. Call the office. Yeah. Or, can, or maybe what? we can get a link out. Or maybe we'll get a link out. Yeah. I'm already getting emails from people and text messages from people wanting to know about that. So I appreciate that. Okay. Let's close with a word of prayer and uh, we'll bid each other peace and enjoy our evening. Let's pray. Merciful God, we thank you for the wonder and the amazement that this season brings to us. The joy of Christmas and how 
uh, followers of Jesus Christ have sought to understand and, and, and portray and proclaim this wondrous moment when you took upon yourself with, uh, with flesh and became Emmanuel, God with us. In the midst of the craziness of our world right now, in the midst of this pandemic, Lord, by your spirit, we pray that we will truly see the joy, the majesty, the holiness of this season of the nativity of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.